Hello and welcome to day 70 of 100 Days of Tonalism. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the study I'm doing today is called A Stormy Day and it's by John Francis Murphy. And uh, we've been getting into quite a lot of Francis Murphy lately and uh, for good reason. He's just a great, great painter and a big inspiration to me. Um, this painting is probably my favorite John Francis Murphy painting. I know I say that about all of them, but this one truly is, you know, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh my God, I, I would love to be able to do something even, even close to that. Um, anyway, uh, we've been reading, uh, f you know, they have a pretty good chapter uh, on, um, well, I don't know if it's a chapter, but it's a section in chapter four of a History of American Tonalism, 1880 to 1920, by David A. Cleveland. Um, and I've been reading uh, from that, uh, you know, as Francis Murphy's come up in our our queue here on uh, 100 Days of Tonalism. Um, I'm going to jump uh, to page 212. I did leave off in 212, but he is in sections of this talking about uh, <coughs> illustrations of paintings that are in the actual book, which wouldn't correspond to what I'm painting today, so yeah, pardon me if I have to skip around. Anyway, we're, uh, we're on page 212, and it says, In 1884, the year of great controversy over William Merritt Chase's domination of the Society of American Artists, Murphy was singled out in the art yearbook for the all-American quality of his work. Not only pictures, but poems and modern poems, his subjects, his education and development, his feeling and, s and sentiment are all purely American. Few landscape painters unite so much personal style, so much individuality of expression with so keen an insight into the subtler phases of nature, and so truthful a rendering of her most airy and effervescent moods. Whoever's writing this about his work is totally on the money. As evidence here, by mid-decade, the fundamental tropes of the toneless movement were firmly established in the public mind. The literary mirroring, the poetic conceits, the subjective transcendentalist stance, the bedrock American ideal. In 1885, during the hiatus of society exhibitions, Murphy not only won the second Halligarten Prize, but also made an associate of the National Academy of Design. Another indication that the war horses of the Hudson River School had faded, even from the walls of the Academy. As Elliot Clark wrote in 1926, one of Murphy's key strengths was the artist's ability to move on from success and take on new challenges. Murphy grew from his best efforts. He knew when he had carried an idea to its uttermost conclusion, and he never repeated the composition of his inspired themes although he so frequently repeated the characteristic example. <laughs> what does that mean? Mm. For the year 1885, Murphy's income from his art totaled more than $3,400, another indication that the toneless landscape artists were making significant inroads in the art market and staking out a niche of their own. Murphy married Ada Clifford Smith, an artist in her own right, in 1883. In 1886, the couple took their one and only trip to Europe, where the Murphys visited museums and Murphy painted. Presumably, Corot and Constable would have been high on his list of artists to view, along with the old masters. The few paintings he produced in France on his European sojourn display a broadening of his approach to form and mass, the elding of extraneous detail, and a more rhythmic quality in his brushstroke. In 1887, the Murphys were well off enough to buy land and build a small summer cottage, Weed Wild, a name that evokes Murphy's early and enduring love of depicting wildflowers and grasses. In Arkville, in the Catskill Mountains of New York State, which would remain Murphy's primary artistic stomping grounds for the next 30 or more years, Murphy began spending more Oh, Murphy began spending from seven to eight months of the year at the Catskills before returning to his studio apartment at the Chelsea Hotel in New York City. In the cold months where his canvases were stretched and painting was completed, 
when his canvases were stretched. Murphy's seasonal migration to the countryside in the spring and back to the city in the fall mirrors the modus operandi for almost every major tonalist artist. It was less a retreat than a return to the creative font of his artistic inspiration where, summer and fall, he breathed in the essences of the natural world, rarely bothering with studies. In his Catskills Hermitage, Murphy simply absorbed impressions and took a few notes, sometimes just jottings on the back of an envelope, storing up visual data and sensations to be composed onto canvas during the winter months in the city. The Murphy homestead, open to the sky and weather and the raw, clear-cut Catskill hillsides, defined his imagery for the rest of his career. Murphy's intimate landscapes broadened to include fallow meadows, clumps of barren trees holding the last of his sere foliage, all encompassed by crystalline atmosphere, a far cry from the cozy New Jersey lowlands of his early inspiration. Well, I can see we're getting close to the end of the video here, so I'd like to thank you for joining me for Day 70. If you would like to see more of my work, go to landscapepainter.co.nz and see my own tonalist paintings there. And we'll see you tomorrow.